Animal Security's advice for cryptocurrencies. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn this over to Pamela to introduce our panel. Thanks, um, And um, I'm going to now pass it directly to the MC tonight, which is Phil Dirty, uh, who's a French origin journalist, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this panel. Thank you. Hola. <laughs> Sorry, yo hablo español, pero no hablo portugués. <laughs> so, uh, I guess we don't have uh, Christian and Jonathan. Christian's here. Yeah, Christian's here. Where is he? Christian is uh, highly expected. <laughs> All right. He's coming. coming. <laughs> Mike is fine. <laughs> All right. So, um, scaling the blockchain, it was my uh, Sunday nightmare <laughs> because uh, I, I spent the whole day to, <coughs> to go through all the technical aspects of uh, scaling the blockchain. And uh, my proposition for tonight is going to be okay. I think Wayne is. Uh, not you, you would uh, wait. I'm always good. Man. Thank you. I thought you were in trouble. Uh, so we just, um, I, I'd like to cover the, the scaling the blockchain in different aspects. So of course we will spend some time on the technical side uh, of, uh, of this topic, but uh, I expect also to, to cover different, uh, different things, which are to me important to have the, uh, the blockchain uh, scale in the coming years. So uh, before to do that, I'd like to have a better idea of the audience. So I have a question for you. Who knows about the blockchain in the room? Okay. Uh, so the rest don't know about the blockchain or oh, heard about and, uh, okay, good. Um, so I propose to introduce uh, the, the panelists and uh, per alphabetic order, so uh, didn't do the jobs. I think, look, you can be the first one. What I would like to, um, is to know is when you paid attention to blockchain, Bitcoin, all those stuff, and why? Sure, uh, so I actually uh, first started paying attention to uh, Bitcoin in, I think it was late 2012 or early 2013. Um, to play online poker <laughs> uh, and, and, and yeah, just gambling and then speculating. Um, and then got even more interested and uh, ordered the first uh, ASIC mining board and I wished uh, that I'd taken that money and just bought Bitcoin instead. Okay, and uh, Christian, you have the same question. What brought you to this uh, beautiful new technology? Yeah, that's great. Uh, a friend of mine told me about Bitcoin at some point. It was uh, 2013. And so I thought it was crazy. <laughs> and so I put $1,000 in. Um, and I think I did the right thing. <laughs> uh, that's how I got in. And then um, I didn't really get why the price was fluctuating so much. So it didn't make sense to me. That's how I started. Do you know a bit more understanding of the protocol layers and um, uh, consensus mechanism and um, consensus protocol and and that's that's it. So uh, that's my friend. <laughs> All right. Friend. Cool. Rosario. Yeah, I guess. Uh, let's see. I started uh, paying attention probably in sometime in 2015. Uh, I was at a, a company that I had founded uh, that was that was ultimately exited to an investment bank in New York, where we had built the entire FX exchange stack and. And what we did for a living was basically aggregate uh, dozens and dozens of liquidity providers and other ECNs and distribute that liquidity for to others to trade. I started hearing about all these exchanges popping up, Kraken and Coinbase, and thought, uh, you know, since I'd never been able to find uh, really good domain expertise out here, I thought they must be not so great. So my thought, initial thought was to basically aggregate that liquidity uh, and quickly realize that you, you can't actually, uh, or at that time, you couldn't actually do that because there was no prime brokerage to clear and sell all those transactions across exchange. So that became the vision uh, and the company that we built out uh, today. Mm -hmm. Nico? 
Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not a super OG in Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I, I actually ran across a Bitcoin checkout at my local cafe, Koopa Cafe in Palo Alto. So I decided I would mine Bitcoin in order to buy a cup of tea. Uh, that was, I think it was 2015, so it was, it was pretty late in the game. Uh, but what ended up happening in 2016 is, uh, uh, basically a friend of mine uh, who builds NoSQL databases basically uh, came up to me and he said, hey, I just discovered this Bitcoin thing and uh, you know, I, I built my own Bitcoin node from scratch and it seems like this is going to be huge. Let's start a company. So we started uh, Evercoin and uh, you know, ever, ever since then I've been sort of hooked. So I think that's me. Yeah, if you did a tour in Silicon Valley, the Cooper Cafe is uh, one of the legends of the, of the region. It's a very nice spot. They don't have a Bitcoin checkout anymore, but they did at the time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, Palo Alto's time. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Mike. Uh, Wayne. Wayne. <laughs> I worry. No, you agree? You, you see, you thought I was in trouble before, but I think you're the one who's in trouble. I, I, oh, definitely I'm shaking, but no, you remind me of a very good friend, so I'm sorry, Wayne, I won't make any mistake again. No worries. Um, so the question was, uh, how did I first get involved in Bitcoin? Uh, I, at first, I remember learning about Bitcoin pretty early on, before the price became uh, a dollar. And I remember that being uh, a, a big deal, but I didn't really pay that much attention to, to Bitcoin uh, until I tried to buy a graphics card and found out that ATI graphics cards were about 25 to 40% more expensive than the same NVIDIA graphics card that, or, uh, NVIDIA graphics card that offered the same level of performance. And when I dug into it, I figured like, oh my god, people are using these to mine Bitcoin. And when I found that level of specialization of hardware and software around this, I thought, wow, there really must be something more to this. This is probably gonna take off uh, at an accelerated pace. So, uh, uh, so around 2012, I, I, you know, I, I built a miner. Um, uh, I built an initial company uh, uh, project really called Coindera, which was a cryptocurrency alert system to get price alerts to your phone. Uh, and then in 2015, uh, we started working on uh, Tyrion, and we launched in the fall of, of 2015. And that's kind of my story about how I got involved. I've been you know, doing things ever since then mm -hmm. in the space 24-7. So it's very interesting. We have uh, trading, gaming. Uh, the, is that will be the background that brought people to the blockchain. Uh, that's what I've noticed a little bit. But uh, that's the background, right? Um, I, I'm from open source software. 25, ah. 25 years. Different background. I, I ran a digital agency and made marketing automation software for 20 years. Okay, good. So, yes? Oh, I was just going to say, um, you know, what, what really got me excited about it was uh, looking at, uh, you know, arbitrage opportunities across different exchanges. I actually mm -hmm. wrote a thesis on uh, market efficiency in the Bitcoin market, um, and then actually created a trading algorithm based on that, and then actually had to write my own 1099B on my tax return, and then I decided I'm never gonna uh, trade again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no one to disrupt the, the bank industry, right? No, it's not about it, right? Well, <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, back offices might, might get in trouble in the future. <laughs> Rosario? No, I mean, I think, uh, I think there's a lot there to be disrupted. I think it goes way beyond um, just, you know, post-trade, you know, reconciliation and and cost reduction. I think I think that's an element of it. I think that's for sure gonna gonna happen. We see that happening across across all the banks. But I think there's I think there's much more to it, especially if you're uh, you know a, a believer in uh, you know where we're going with digital securities. Mm. Okay. So the next question that I'd like to ask you is uh, to give you a chance to speak more about your company, the news, and uh, we will keep that for the end. But. Uh, how do you scale the blockchain, uh, you guys, uh, with your company? Um, I guess are you talking to me about first? I'm talking to everyone uh, because to give the <laughs> chance to uh, say a little bit more about the company that uh, sure. you guys are running. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, you know, so I'm I'm probably one of the few in, in the room that um, uh, is involved in sort of private permissioned uh, ledger systems. So so we're not, you know, our way of scaling uh, the capabilities of public blockchain was basically to use it as a final settlement layer only 
and to build an enterprise uh, solution that is essentially run by custodians. So we built a multi-custodian blockchain network. We have a solution we give to custodians. It lets those custodians hold digital assets, fiat assets, really anything. Could be natively digital securities, non-natively digital securities. Uh, they, the, the solution we give to the trading entities lets them ask the custodians to essentially tokenize those assets onto a custodial blockchain ledger. Those assets are then freely tradable with anybody in the network with no you know, counterparty or settlement risk. And they're provably there at the custodian and incorporated into the actual real-time uh, pre-trade risk and the entire execution pipeline. We effectively do um, a, tra a trade in our world is effectively an atomic swap that we're able to do between any custodial asset ledger and any other custodial asset ledger. Wayne, you have a mic. How do you scale the blockchain? Scale, how do you scale? Yeah. How do you, no, how do you scale the blockchain with your company? Yes. We don't. <laughs> because blockchain shouldn't scale. And I know that's a controversial statement. But <clears throat> so uh, let me qualify that and I'll explain a little bit about what we do. So you have to ask yourself, you know, the first blockchain was Bitcoin. Um, and the reason we have blocks is because of proof of work. The system needs a way without any authorities to come to an agreement about what is the next set of transactions to add to the ledger. All right? So in order to do that, you needed to make it expensive to add a new set of transactions to the ledger and expensive to add a transaction to the system because it's permissionless. And so proof of work essentially burns electricity to prove that you've done a certain amount of work to be able to add that next block to the ledger. And the expense of doing that and the uh, hash linked list of all of these blocks creates a way for a high level of security and a high level of cost to be able to recreate all of that. Nobody can just come by and, and, and remake the Bitcoin blockchain without doing all of the computing power and burning all the electricity that historically has been put into it. So that's why we have blocks. And now, what it's good for, it, it, so let me go, go back into 20, 2014, 2015. Um, I had been making marketing automation software, and our business model was a performance-based business model. So if people used our software and our, and our platform, we made money on a percentage of growth of online sales or a uh, number of leads. And so our customers were always naturally <coughs> suspect of the numbers that we were reporting to them because they had to pay a bill based on the veracity of those numbers. So I thought to myself, well, maybe what I can do is uh, take some of these you know, proof of existence type technologies or, you know, that are out there for Bitcoin and make them scalable and applicable to the high volume of data that, that, that's going, going through our system. And that was really the, the starting point. So what we did is uh, myself and, and, and some other people, we came up with a protocol called Chainpoint, which is a very simple way to link data to the Bitcoin blockchain and generate a timestamp proof. It's good for verifying the integrity of data, uh, an audit trail for a business process, and we built a SaaS application initially that allowed people to, uh, to, to do this. And so we, the advantage there is that by linking things to Bitcoin, there's an economic incentive to persist that linkage in the data in the Bitcoin blockchain around the world. And people can have a high degree of confidence that that information, that linkage, if you will, um, is not, has not been compromised. So, so the problem that we solve, or that people solve with our technology, is being able to prove to other people that the, uh, like a data set hasn't been modified, a log, set of log files hasn't been modified, a business process occurred in a particular order, or a digitally signed document actually existed at a particular point in time that was signed at this point in time. And all of that happens off-chain. We have millions and millions of transactions going through our, our system every day, and they, um, uh, we only publish one transaction to the Bitcoin blockchain per hour for the whole network. So all of the scaling, if you will, from a technical perspective sits off-chain because if you have a blockchain, a real blockchain like Bitcoin, it shouldn't scale. It should remain expensive, and it should remain small, and you know, we've had lots of fights over this over the past uh, couple of years, but I think people are finally starting to resolve this. Now, people are also calling other types of applications blockchains. 
And um, back in the, in, in the early and mid-90s when I was getting started, we had the internet, intranets, and extranets. Intranet was using the internet protocol inside your company to make an application. Um, extranets were a way to connect with your suppliers and, and, and everybody else in the world. That was a part of your, 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 your business network. Uh, I see blockchain being used to basically describe extranets. Using cryptography as a way to verify either the transfer of assets or have secure interactions with other uh, trusted parties, for the most part, semi-trusted parties, uh, in, in inside the network. Um, I don't think the word blockchain is going to change. I just think it's changed, uh, I'm sorry, it's not going to go away, but it has changed fundamentally from what it was back when I first got involved with, uh, uh, with Bitcoin. So, you know, blockchain ain't what it used to be. Uh, now we have some questions for you, Arthur. So, Doc, how do you scale, please, scale the blockchain? Sure, sure. And, you know, I think uh, following on Wayne's point there, you know, blockchain is kind of a, a nice nice buzzword for really a, you know, distributed database uh, with an economic incentive uh, for people to all uphold the same uh, exact data, right? Uh, redundantly and immutably storing that data. And do you guys use hashes? Yes. Yeah. Um, and so we, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, talk around technical scalability, you know, increase block size, you know, make blocks uh, get confirmed faster, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, what we really focus on at New ID is um, empowering all the really exciting possible use cases uh, that, that could utilize blockchain to be able to actually do so. Um, and so you can think about, you know, for instance, digitizing uh, assets like real estate titles, equities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you need an identity layer and you need the actual individuals or entities to be able to be represented um, to associate those assets with for that to ever really work, right? Because if you just have a public key uh, and a wallet sitting on a computer and you, know, you have an equity token uh, stored on that wallet, and your, you know, your house burns down, um, that equity disappears, just like a lot of Bitcoin have been uh, completely, um, you know, have disappeared and, and become irrecoverable. And that fundamentally doesn't work for you know, digital assets, right? And so um, what I focus on and, and my team focuses on at NewID is actually building out the foundational authentication layer um, to provide what we call trustless authentication for trusted identity. Uh, to help allow uh, applications and, and exciting new um, services to exist uh, and, and use the blockchain. Because, I mean, right now we really just have, you know, a lot of people speculating on cryptocurrencies, and that's not what's going to just scale the blockchain indefinitely. Christian, how do you scale the blockchain with your company? Yeah, I'll keep it short. Basically, uh, two ways. One went with uh, IBM blockchain on the cloud. So uh, that's pretty scalable. It's a permission-based blockchain, um, and it's scalable. It uses Kubernetes, so it's it's something that you know allows us to kind of serve small clients and big companies as well. Second way is that as we work with uh, large files. Um, what Blockstar does, we're, we're basically taking brands and we're using branded virtual goods. Um, think about like a Nike shoe, a virtual Nike shoe, or uh, I don't know, a digital Ferrari, a virtual car. I make them available inside video games and digital experiences. Some of these files tend to be pretty big, right? There are live objects that needs to be alive and working inside these games. So what we do, we basically hash them off so we, we don't necessarily store it on the blockchain. We, we have a, an ash, it's a reference point that allows them to kind of pull them from, from, a, from, a, from a, a outside storage. Um, so that's the way that we, we do it. Miko. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, to me, like, the question is a difficult one because ultimately there really are three concepts of scaling. So I just want to like make sure that we're all on the same page here. So to me, what I've seen is I've seen what's called layer zero, layer one, and layer two scaling solutions. So really the mindset around scaling is technical scalabilities. When people talk about scaling, they're really talking about how do you make smart contracts or how do you make transactions faster, right? That's really the mindset of scaling, right? So, you know, just to lay it out, like the notion of a, a layer zero solution 
is basically some kind of a network protocol that speeds up actual communications between nodes, right? So that's one approach, right? Layer one solution is typically uh, a consensus oriented, right? So basically allows traditional kind of distributed, you know, I think you refer to them as essentially databases, you know, how do they achieve consensus faster, you know, so that's kind of the layer two scaling. Typically what you find is you find that most of the scaling involves playing with trust, which is why I think that Wayne was saying that scaling shouldn't happen. Um, and then, you know, so it plays with trust and centralization, and then obviously layer two scaling, and layer two scaling is basically things like payment channels, you know, and things where, again, you play with trust, right? So you're playing with trust and effectively moving things off chain, or you're moving them into sort of a so-called side chain where you have this kind of uh, Merkleizing index that enables you to maintain consistency between the main chain and the side chain or off chain. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that, you know, these are the basic three approaches that I've seen, right? Which is layer zero, layer one, and layer two scaling. Uh, just to give you all kind of a basic taxonomy of scaling solutions, technical scaling solutions. But what I mean by playing with trust is basically what Bitcoin proves is it proves that lack of trust is expensive, right? So if you don't trust anyone, if you trust zero parties, then you're going to go down to seven transactions per second, uh, which is, and you're going to burn a lot of electricity. And that's the result. It's a result of I don't trust anyone. Um, the thing that's interesting is if you move the slider of trust to I can trust one party, then what you have is you have the Oracle database. And I can give you as many transactions as the normal business application wants, right? Because I can go in memory, I can buy like Exadata, I can buy like big fat boxes, terabyte of RAM, I can give you billions of transactions. So if you can trust one party, you're done. Like you're, you're basically done. Uh, so, you know, there's all kinds of complicated things like, oh, well, in EOS, you need to trust 21 parties, you know, so there's all these different people putting the slider in different places, right? But I think if I, if I got your message right, I mean, like, you should keep the slider at zero, and you shouldn't actually trust, if you're going to use a blockchain, you might as well trust no one and get the most benefit. So I think that's what you were implying, so, you know. That's, so to me, I just wanted to hit that as sort of the, those are the core basic principles, and you know, anything that increases the speed ought to decrease the trust. Like, you know, that's, it, it, how else would it, how else could it work? Uh, can I just add to that too a little bit? I mean, I think that um, we're gonna see all of those things that you mentioned, the entire spectrum there continue, continue to exist, right? Because there's gonna be some sort of data that people want, you know, guaranteed, immutably stored. They're gonna be willing to spend a lot of money uh, to have, you know, ultra redundant uh, storage across, you know, a proof of work based blockchain like Bitcoin, right? But a lot of data you don't need on that. You can do that on the side chains, you know, and, and then you can just, you can even hash a side chain and put that into the blockchain, right? So we're going to see a lot more kind of cross chain referencing and, and data publishing, I think, depending on the type of data. Yeah, and I was going to say, I basically agree with that. Um, but some domains actually dictate that you, you know, necessarily, uh, in order to achieve um, the kind of scalability you need, you have to trust some parties. And so, in a, for example, in an institutional trading context, <clears throat> it's not unreasonable to trust the custodian that's holding your assets, or to trust the DTCC, or, you know, the, the whatever the case may be. So, um, I would argue that a public ledger system, even if we were to achieve some of the things that people are trying to achieve with scalability in terms of transaction throughput, when you have sort of a uh, distributed system like that that crosses geographies, you're already at uh, sort of a, a, a transaction, um, uh, you have a latency issue that will directly impact how usable it is to incorporate uh, blockchain into a real-time trading context, and so what, what I mean, and that's why you see a lot of solutions pursuing a post-trade recordation sort of style of applying blockchain or distributed ledger to the problem. But you do get some benefits from from taking blockchain, um, even though it's maybe not as you know it's it's not um, as perfect as as Bitcoin might be uh, in terms of having. Um, non-repudiation mechanisms, right? So if you think about a system like ours, 
you're not, we're not using it just for recordation. You actually have assets that custodians have written to a custodial blockchain ledger that are provably there, cryptographically provably there, that are incorporated into real-time pre-trade risk uh, so that you can actually transact with parties that you don't trust in an anonymous fashion. Your only trusted party in the network like that are the custodians, so your only risk is really custodial risk. And that is um, something that works in, you know, in the capital markets trading use case, but doesn't work. Uh, but it wouldn't, you, you cannot get there with a, with a public ledger system. You need the determinism um, around the, uh, the transaction time. I mean, you're talking about measuring things, different parts of the, the, the trade life cycle in single digit microseconds, right? So you have some small number of milliseconds with determinism that dictate whether or not it's usable for a real time trading use case. And I think that applies to cryptocurrencies as well. I mean, who here has tried to uh, use you know, a Bitcoin ATM, right? Um, you know, if a block isn't uh, going to be confirmed for you know 24 hours, say the mempool is 20x, <laughs> you know what a block size could be, you might go try and withdraw some uh, you know fiat uh, and have to come back the next day to the ATM to actually get your cash. So uh, you know there's a lot of issues around that latency. To uh, Miko's study, to uh, qualify a bit the different aspect of uh, the, the problem of scaling, um, how would, because we, there's the software aspect, there's the hardware, there's the private blockchain, the public blockchain, the protocol, uh, I'm just thinking about uh, the, the people in the room still, um, interested to understand more how can we kind of uh, summarize the, the, the major uh, technology issues that um, the blockchain has to to really uh, be uh, more efficient. I would say it's it's, it's not, to me it's not just a technology issue. Um, it's more than that. If you think about uh, the internet, um, things didn't really took off back then until like people got comfortable and kind of typing their credit cards um, and start kind of purchasing things online with the SSL protocol, right? The little golden lock at the bottom. Um, so, so I think it's more of a, a, a three-step process, where you know, as people get more comfortable with the with the blockchain, um, uh, more and more attentions and money will actually be um, employed in in the scalability aspect, which eventually will, will allow us to kind of have a scalable system. But you know, probably most of you know Maslow hierarchy of needs, seven steps of Maslow. No, yes, no. Yeah. So the, fir the, first, the first step is basically safety and security, and that's how people move, right? If you know that you're not going to be dead, killed tomorrow, right? You're actually comfortable to kind of play with the game. And that's what I think, you know, until we're going to have a, a secure system on the blockchain that goes from, from wallets to uh, exchanges all the, all the way down to whatever it is in the entire ecosystem, people are not going to be comfortable and really going to spend their time playing and understanding how blockchain works and what it's needed for. Um, once you have safety and security, you start thinking about stability, right? So once you're safe, you start spending a little bit of money in, but you can't buy a cappuccino today or a frappuccino for five bucks today, and tomorrow is going to cost you 50 bucks because of the volatility, right? So that's when stability of the coin is going to become very important. And once you have security and stability, now you start thinking about scalability. That's when the mass will start moving. Start spending Bitcoin to buy a frappuccino, to buy groceries, to buy gas. Um, and so at that point, I think we're going to have a lot more attention, a lot more money poured into the infrastructure needed for scalability that will become scalable. Sure. I want to, we we'll come to that because I think it's, I'm very curious about the mass adoption of uh, the blockchain, but let's, uh, if someone has to say about the, just to summarize a bit, the technical aspect of uh, where is the big problem, if it's more on the, so, so uh, you know, I wanted to respond to that. I, you know, e to me, like it's very, very dependent on what you're trying to do, and so I'm very much kind of like a sort of a multi-coinist, right? So e because because the way I look at it is, is it's it's application dependent. People have this kind of like really weird requirement that Bitcoin be like an all singing, all dancing thing because they don't actually understand what money is, right? Like money is software. So you know, don't, money is not data. Money is you know, like people think money is data. Like it's like wow, that's amazing, right? It, it is not data. Money is not data. Money is software. And if you reason about money as being software, then you have to actually now understand that money is a bunch of different softwares, right? Like the credit card processing is one software. 
Debit cards is slightly different software. Gift cards and other software. Cash register point of sales and other software. They're all different software. So like the idea that there's one all singing, all dancing Bitcoin software that handles every monetary use case that there is misunderstands like fundamentally what money is and it misunderstands what software is and it misunderstands what Bitcoin is. So like, you know, I just don't think that there is an all singing, all dancing case for money. Like there's many packages. So because there are many packages, like I feel like for example, payment use cases will be covered by Line Link, Cacao Clayton, Telegram Ton, Facebook Libra, uh, and whatever those crazy letters were for the People's Bank of China coin <laughs> that they're gonna launch with like WeChat and Alibaba. DC. There's a bunch of letters, DC. right? But the point I'm making is, is that those will do payment. And why should Bitcoin have to? Like it just feels like you're asking for a whole lot of things that aren't needed. Man, just comment on that. <clears throat> Nobody wants Bitcoin to sing and dance. Yeah, yes. Nobody wants to okay. that, that could be that could get ugly. Um, <laughs> the people who are working on Bitcoin or are passionate about it, they want it to do one thing well right now. They want it to be a reliable, censorship resistant store of value. The whole point of Bitcoin is to have money or a value transfer network or a store of value that is outside of the purview or control of any government or any uh, uh, trusted uh, uh, authority. Nobody wants to do fish notarization on Bitcoin. Nobody wants to do other types of applications on top of, uh, of, of, of Bitcoin directly because it is expensive. It is intentionally slow and expensive. However, if you take something like um, Hyperledger Fabric, which is a popular blockchain platform, and you know, we, we wrote something at Tyrion where if you, if, with Hyperledger Factory, you had a set of, of trusted validators who validate all the transactions, all the data that's happening in between people. And what we do, we build something that you periodically take a hash of a set of transactions and you link it to the Bitcoin blockchain and you get back a proof that gets added to a, a log inside the, the system. And what this does is it allows you to have the, the confidence that those validators just didn't go back and just re-sign a bunch of data without, because if they did, um, it, this, these proofs would be invalid. So in a, in a very broad sense, you're inheriting the security of the Bitcoin blockchain into, into that application. Um, I think that uh, something like, so you're, you're right, Miko, about talking about, you have you know, base layer protocol, and then you have layer two protocols. Chainpoint is a layer two protocol. Lightning, uh, which is a way to do fast payments off chain on Bitcoin that settle on chain to Bitcoin um, eventually. Uh, and have payment channels and things like that. Um, that's a layer. That's a layer two protocol. Uh, there are people paying for things with Lightning today. Um, you know, we're doing some work at Tyrion with Lightning. Um, there's a, a promising future for this, but you have to build at a, a, a base layer, and you have to layer things on. People are trying to make Bitcoin more efficient. They're trying to make the the signature mechanism that you use to sign transactions to be less um, to consume fewer bytes on chain. People are very concerned in Bitcoin about something like the called the cost of node of, cost of node operations. They want the node to be inexpensive to run so that uh, it doesn't get you know. So if you double the size of the blockchain or 10x the size of the blockchain, you're not able to run it on small devices. You you have a, a predictable future with Bitcoin right now about the rate of growth of the Bitcoin blockchain. And so people are trying to make it do everything. It's not appropriate to do everything. But the word blockchain is just being applied to a whole host of things, some of which are entirely unrelated. Um, but it all comes back to, you know, Bitcoin, people's excitement about it. Um, and then I guess they just want that excitement to keep carrying forward. Yep. They don't want to be the greater fool. <laughs> right? I mean, I think, it. I think Bitcoin, um, you know, is, is it's like a brand name, right? And that's what people associate with, quote, unquote, blockchain. And at the end of the day, Bitcoin is, you know, the original kind of blockchain. It's uh, one of the most dispersed in terms of the actual, you know, coin holdings. So you, you're not, you know, at risk uh, as much for market manipulation and whatnot. But at the end of the day, the Bitcoin blockchain is really bad at uh, payments, right? And as Miko was saying, I think that, you know, we're going to see uh, other forms of distributed database systems with uh, economic incentive structures that are much more efficient uh, for payments, 
um, and, and we're gonna see interoperability between these different chains. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, the proof of work system, as Wayne was explaining, is you know, it's expensive and that is by design and it's to uh, really, you know, guarantee um, that you're going to be able to, you know, trust this network over time because people are going to be upholding these, these nodes and uh, people are going to have to think about you know, how much data they're going to want to pay to store on it, right? Which is usually very little. Um, so I think we're going to see just a lot of different chains. Uh, Bitcoin probably will be around for a long time. But I, I'd probably disagree that it will ever be stable in terms of uh, it, its value, <laughs> unless you trust somebody like a monetary authority. Uh, I think Bitcoin will be stable because it already is stable. One Bitcoin is always <laughs> worth one Bitcoin. <laughs> Fair enough. Because the dollar is not stable. Yeah, I, mean, I basically, I think I basically agree with all of that. I mean, it, it, it's to me, it's a store of value, and, and any of the any of the public ledger systems are a great sort of final settlement layer. But the way we scale and on the enterprise side was, I mean, we looked around. Uh, you know, I mean, think about a blockchain ledger. It's really there's really an I/O problem there, right? So if everybody's sharing a single ledger, um, you 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 have obvious bottlenecks. And so the way we approached it was we built a ground up blockchain stack, same transaction model as Bitcoin. Um, we implemented it in Java, um, but it's a multi-ledger architecture. So every custodian in our network has a unique asset ledger per asset per custodian. And so you get this kind of very natural logical sharding, but sharing the common protocol so you can still do an atomic swap um, and create guarantees that we're able to create when you transact between two custodial ledgers. Uh, can, I, can I just add something? Just to kind of clarify, because I think we'd be confusing a few things. Uh, you know, I hate to talk about blockchain. In reality, I think you know, when we say blockchain, it's not, it's not necessarily correct, right? We should be talking about DLT, decentralized blockchains. <coughs> yeah, you have blockchain, you have sidechain, you have DAX, you have a bunch of stuff. So we should, we should correctly name it as DLT. The second thing is that blockchains are not cryptocurrencies and vice versa. Cryptocurrency live on blockchains, but blockchain might actually, DLT, pardon me, I'm actually saying myself, <laughs> DLT um, uh, can actually have multiple use cases behind uh, payments, right? And so when we, when we talk about scalability, I'd like, I'd like to be precise on what we talk about. Right, in terms of, is it, is it a, are we talking about scalability of you know, payment transactions, like Visa, for example? Or are we talking about um, a source of other different transactions, like, for example, storing um, uh, real estate transactions? Right? Or, or even media information, like videos and music, right? So I think, um, I just want to kind of put a word of caution in terms of qualifying the statements, that's all. We will come to it. Well, I was just going to you know, expound upon that and agree totally that you know, payments are just you know, one of the first use cases of a blockchain, right? Of uh, distributed ledger technology, and I think we're gonna see uh, multiple, multiple other use cases, right? Um, for storing data, distributing data, uh, and, and payments will just be one part of it. Uh, I, think, I think one thing I wanted to address, uh, kind of on behalf of the audience, is, is sort of why. Uh, so like, why, why scale, right? I think Wayne hit the nail on the head where it's basically like, well, if you want a blockchain, you want Bitcoin, then, the slowness is actually a feature, <clears throat> and it's a great feature, and it's you know so therefore why should we increase it? You know and what we're seeing, for example, on things like EOS is that EOS is very fast, and so it produces lots of blocks very quickly. And one of the problems is storage. So what you're finding with a lot of the block producers is that they're actually not storing the whole blockchain anymore, which kind of messes around with immutability, right? So to me, like that's an issue. And one of the things that's fascinating about that issue is it turns out that Proof of work is dependent on a thermodynamic principle that converting a zero to a one costs energy. And if converting a zero to a one didn't cost energy, then proof of work would fail, and vice versa, making a one a zero. But the second law of thermodynamics also says that keeping a zero a zero costs energy, and keeping a one a one costs energy. And so storage actually hasn't been properly incentivized you know, by, by the network. So you know, because we have a properly incentivized storage, uh, we really ought not to grow blockchain faster than, than we should. So, so to me, you know, blockchain, whatever you want to call it, but the thing that I really want to get at is I want to get at like why, like why scaling? Why, why do people want to scale? And I think the best place to look is to look at Ethereum. And the fact that we're looking at Ethereum is actually great. And the reason why I'm excited about the fact that we're all looking at Ethereum, the thing that's amazing is, is people are going, oh wow, Ethereum's slow, it's slow, it's terrible, right? Uh, okay, so, so let's take a different analogy. 
Like, whenever Apple announces like a new iPhone, like if you go out in front of an Apple store and you see a huge line of people like waiting to give Apple a thousand dollars, right? And what are they going to say? They're going to say, "Oh, Apple is slow, right? It's Apple. Apple is slow at dispensing things that I want to pay for." That's what people are saying about Ethereum, right? They're basically because every single transaction on Ethereum costs gas. It costs money. So the idea that there's an economic payment that's occurring and people can't push money into Ethereum fast enough for their liking is a good thing, right? So I just want to make sure everyone understands that because everyone's like, wow, Ethereum is slow. That's a bad thing. It's like, no, that is a good thing. If you see a big line outside an Apple store, people really desperately trying to shove money into Apple, that's good for Apple, right? So I just want to make sure people understand that. So the reason why Ethereum comes up, though, is it's the depends on what you're trying to do problem. Right? Which is, if you're trying to create a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, which isn't quite what Bitcoin is, but if you're trying to create one of those, then you should have one prop set of properties. And if you're trying to create a world computer, which is what Ethereum purports to be, which it isn't either, uh, you should have a different set of performance characteristics. So, so that's, that's kind of what I'm poking at. And those costs too, you know, force people to actually think about efficiency, right? In terms of, you know, whether they want to compute, whether they want to store. But that's great. Right, which is exactly, exactly. But, you know, one interesting aspect of scalability also is the fact that as time goes on and transactions continue to occur, these, uh, you know, distributed ledger databases are always growing, right? And so something we're going to have to continue to face is what do you do about that, right? Are you, you know, is everyone always going to hold a full node in 100 years from now? <laughs> I'm going to get interested. Thank you for. Can I just add a, add a comment to? Well, you can have my my question is waiting, but you you're the panelist, so you have, Thank you. You have the priority. <laughs> um, so we're talking about Ethereum. Ethereum is almost prohibitively expensive for businesses to run. Uh, if you have a very high powered computer and you connect to the Ethereum network, it can take days if you want to sync up uh, the entire chain, mm -hmm. and. If you told somebody that you were going to design a, uh, a, a computing system, a world computer, by creating a distributed blog file in which you could embed JavaScript-like scripts, and every single copy, every computer would replicate every copy of that log file and execute every single script. If you went to a traditional tech conference and said, That's, we're going to build that, it's going to be the world computer, and yeah, I mean, people up here are laughing already because it is, it is beyond insanity. It's like saying that you're going to build an email system where you, your email server is going to process every single email message that is sent by everybody ever around the world, and it's going to hang on to them forever. You know, I wrote an article in 2016 called Who Pays for the Decentralized Web, where we talk about all the, econo the, the lack of economic incentives to hang on to data forever for things like... Um, uh, distributed storage or the Ethereum blockchain, and I don't, I don't see there being a lot of answers to these problems. I, I think people are trying to solve an impossible problem in this particular case. I think that, as you know, if you go out in the world right now and you say, "What are people doing with blockchain?" The answer is not much. You know, there are some things that people are doing that are interesting. Um, a company that I invested in called TokenSoft. They created a standard called uh, ERC-1404, which is a way for you to issue securities on a blockchain in a, in a compliant way. Now, securities transactions for private businesses are small and infrequent. And the fact that you can have them on a public ledger is you know, somewhat useful. Um, and that is a different use case besides payments that might have some uh, applicability uh, in, in, into the future. Um, and there's other solutions with Ethereum like sharding and other ways that we're trying to, or not we, but the world, the community, is trying to be able to uh, improve the scalability. But I feel like as we, we grow, we're progressing back towards traditional system designs for distributed systems um, that, that, that don't really have any new serious uh, innovations in them. So if you want to build uh, an application for uh, supply chain, or you want to do something uh, in trade finance or anything else, there are ledger style software that we now call blockchains that exist. Find a really good one and, 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 and build it. Um, but I think that if you are trying to scale up the base layer blockchain to do all of the things, like you were saying earlier, 
it's just not going to work. There are other layer two protocols like Lightning Network and Rated, which is the equivalent of Lightning on Ethereum, um, uh, and, and several others that may provide some of the capabilities. But ultimately, you cannot have, you cannot scale a public network to be able to be to do all the singing and dancing, all the songs, every dance move, um, uh, uh, for all time. All right. Um, I was checking the news, and uh, Miko, thank you for introducing uh, Ethereum. Uh, I saw that uh, the project scale uh, raised uh, 70 million, um, so it's a layer two platform, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I would like you to, to understand how, the, how it works in terms of uh, who are the investors behind uh, all of your companies, who are the typical companies, VCs, putting money into this, uh, this company to understand a bit what's the landscape of uh, the financing behind those, uh, all those companies, like yeah, Ethereum um, or others? I, so, so, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm, one of my hats is I'm a professional investor in venture role. Uh, so, you know, I can give you kind of the quick snapshot of the psychology, right, which is that there was a time when kind of layer one investment was pretty fashionable. And I think one of the problems with the layer one investment is, is that people would really have super high valuations and they have super big raises for these kind of like it's super speculative projects that would like ship sometime in like many years from now. You know, and professors would be like or just here. yeah, so called professor coin type projects. You know, and 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 what ended up happening was was that this kind of almost broke the venture capital machine in Silicon Valley because it just doesn't behave like anyone expected, right? And so because of that, I think right now the the layer one solution investment paradigm for VCs is kind of broken and essentially stopped, right? So layer one scaling is kind of done. Uh, you know, so what it means is it means that Silicon Valley has made their bets. So there's really maybe, you know, 20 different layer one scaling solutions and that's all we're going to have for from the venture world. Uh, uh, there may be super amazing solutions coming out of academia, but they won't be quite as well funded. So that's what I think. Obviously, there's additional layer zero solutions being funded, and there's additional layer two solutions being funded that are application dependent. But that's that's my take. Any other who's who's pushing money to your company? Who's uh, who are the investors? So uh, our our investors are blockchain capital. Digital Currency Group and Fenbushi, and we raised money back in uh, 2015. Um, and at the time, there weren't many people who had our product. We actually built a working product and got customers before we, we, we raised money. And it, uh, today, I mean, the landscape has definitely uh, evolved quite a bit. Um, you know, Blockchain Capital and Digital Currency Group are the number one and number two investors in Bitcoin and blockchain companies by deal volume. And so they're making lots of smaller bets, t traditionally into uh, a lot of companies. You know, I, I remember Barry Silbert, who's the, the CEO of, of DCG, saying there was a there was a time where he just found every decent exchange out there and then made investments in a bunch of exchanges. Since he didn't know, you know, whether the exchange in India was going to work or whether Coinbase was going to work or whatever, but it was sort of a sector bet. It wasn't really a spray and pray approach, um, but people were were uh, there. There's definitely been theses. One of the major theses that came along that was pioneered by blockchain capital was the idea of a security token. The blockchain capital, we issued the first security token. And at the time, um, there was talk about uh, liquidity. As an investor, in, in, in a venture investor, you usually don't get liquidity until you know, seven to 10 years out, typically. But uh, now there was the opportunity to get liquidity earlier. Now, regulatory things have changed that quite a bit and slowed that down. Um, but that was part of the, the that was the meme of the moment uh, for a while, maybe late 2016, early early 2017. Um, there are a lot of Professor Coin projects. That's become a, a term that you hear a lot. Um, and I, 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 you know, if you have a good business that happens to use blockchain uh, or Bitcoin or anything that any of these public currencies, um, you're going to be able to. Uh, get investors. You're going to be able to raise some capital and probably have a decent shot of being able to uh, make that work. But if you if you don't have a practical business use, if you don't understand, if you can't articulate to your investors, who is the user of our product? What is the channel by which they are going to acquire our product? How are we going to price it? Things like that. Then 
you're you're not likely to be able to to raise money in this environment. You know, back in in, in 2017, those things were not at all a concern, and people were just putting money into into all sorts of projects. But that that is over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that was a huge hype wave, right? Uh, people wanted to basically buy a token and then sell it for a lot more, a little bit uh, further down the road. And I think that it's actually really good that uh, we've seen that kind of die out. Um, and, and I heard a stat recently, actually, that like in Singapore, for instance, uh, there's actually uh, more money raised uh, via token issuances, ICOs, than in IPOs this last year. Um, most of which were related to blockchain-based companies. Um, but I think that you know, as we work out a number of issues around you know, KYC uh, and anti-money laundering laws and, and, and regulatory issues, um, and I would argue, you know, identity being a big piece of that, um, we're going to see businesses that aren't related to blockchain be able to actually raise capital via a digital security um, uh, sorry, using a token. Right, exactly. And so that's you know a big part of scalability, I think, as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the environment has definitely changed. Um, probably for the probably for the better. It's probably for the better of the industry, but uh, it is a challenging environment. So our, our we've raised about seventeen million to date. Um, and use that to fund an almost four-year pure technology build out before we actually were able to go live. It's a quite big infrastructure play, and that's been super challenging. All of our investors have been, you know, basically markets experts. We have no traditional venture capital. Uh, it's been, you know, university endowment money, you know, indirectly through hedge fund that invests on their behalf. It's been, you know, big asset managers like Polar and Fidelity. It's been guys like Susquehanna and Cowan, and, you know, people that. Uh, are in the markets and understand sort of the, the, the deep infrastructure that, that we're working on. We haven't been able to figure out how to make it resonate with the, with the general Silicon Valley uh, venture community, unfortunately. Mm. Re really quick to add to that, you know, what's funny is um, I spent way too much time trying to figure out how we can do an ICO, right, to, you know, raise money during the big hype wave of uh, token issuances, because you see, you know, these companies raising 20, 40, 100 million dollars, right? Uh, with a token, and um, you know, after thinking about it more and more, it's like this: this isn't really real, right? And there's going to be this regulatory crackdown, et cetera, et cetera. And so we actually ended up raising, you know, our capital uh, just through traditional uh, convertible notes with angel investors and institutions. Okay. Yeah. Granted, we we're not a token-based company. Mm -hmm. Christian, you want to add something? No, I mean our our investors. Because that's a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I mean, I, agree, right, I mean, right. yeah, I mean, our investors are angel or negotiating a, a, a seed round from a from a from a big um, seed fund right now. Uh, but I would say, you know, the type of investors that invest in these companies are any investor that invests in new businesses, right? So if you have clients, if you have revenues, right? If you if you have technology that works, but as opposed to 2016, 17, 18, right? It's less about the technology, it's more about the tractions. Uh, I think any investor, you know, would invest in such a business. Mm. Um, going fast, uh, Casper Labs uh, rise money recently. Uh, I did my job, and mostly to hire developers. Is it hard to find the the, the, the talent you need inside of a company to 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 be uh, you know with the right uh, staff you need? Competency is rare. Just in yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, the, th the thing that's really interesting becomes, like, when you look at Casper, like, the, the origins and history of Casper are essentially, like, you know, what happened was, was if you, if you look at Ethereum, right, like, there are really two proposals, and the two proposals basically were for, uh, essentially, proof of stake, which is different from proof of work, right? So the two proposals are basically one from Vlad Zamfir, and the other one was a proposal from Vitalik, right? So what happened essentially was, was that our chain was actually sort of the forked version that went with the Vlad Zamfir proposal, but it turns out that that governance structure of our chain was kind of really just pretty hopeless, and so that project failed, and then Casper Labs basically sprung out of that and is the kind of like genetic successor to the Vlad Zamfir proof of stake concept. But so I, I just wanted to comment quickly on, on mm -hmm. you know, and the reason why all of this is relevant is, is because Ethereum is probably the most kind of hot choke point for scaling, right? That's why everyone's hot about scaling because Ethereum is slow, right? And I think, you know, so, so just to kind of like put a fine point on this from the perspective of scaling, you know, 
uh, you know, I think Lane said something interesting about sort of there won't be a world computer. You know, I think that's pretty fair. But I think one of the things that is interesting is is instead of world computer, you know, what we did get is we got a vending machine for securities, you know, in the form of ICO contracts, and it was actually pretty good at that, right? Like, and and, and so I I think that um, there are applications, and I think I'm with. Uh, you know, Nick Zabo on the smart contract, which is a smart contract is a Visa vending machine. So like, ultimately the reason why a smart contract is a vending machine is that you are either handling product, which is the output of the vending machine, or you're handling money, which is the input of the vending machine. And if you're spending any lines of code doing anything other than those two things, you should take those that code out. That code should not be executing in this slowness. So the only reason why you pay a penalty to run smart contract code and you run it so slow is because you're either handling the money coming in or you're handling product going out. Otherwise, get the code out of the smart contract. It's a waste. Okay, so the money comes. You want to say something? Yeah, I just quickly, you asked about is it hard to find developers? Yes. And the answer is yes. Um, okay. And uh, we've been uh, very lucky. We have some wonderful people uh, on our team. Uh, I moved to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area to be able to uh, get access to better developers. I started the company I was living in Hartford, Connecticut, where I was for, for about 20 years. And uh, ironically, uh, some of the best, you know, we have, we've got guys come over from uh, BitMEX, uh, guys from Purse came over. The people who were into Bitcoin and were, were passionate about the technology have turned out to be the best performers at Tyrion. Some of the other people we have on our team who aren't there anymore, um, you could kind of say they were older and they had their head in the clouds, meaning like cloud computing. They just didn't understand the new paradigm. And they were always trying to push things towards the more centralized cloud-based solution when it wasn't always appropriate for what our business goals and what we were trying to do. So even if you could find people with the skills, be making sure that everybody is aligned and everybody uh, understands that you're building something that is going to have technical trade-offs based on what you're trying to accomplish as a business, I think uh, can be difficult, especially with more seasoned people who think they understand things better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it's, it's quite hard to kind of find developers. Um, I mean, we, we got lucky. Uh, we're building on Hyperledger. So if any of you is an Hyperledger developer, see me after. <laughs> so I'm going to make a summary of the 10 next questions uh, to finish this panel. <laughs> No, I know that. I mean, it's, uh, you are full of enthusiasm. And, uh, so um, I had a lot of fun reading that uh, Bitcoin uh, scaling problem uh, forced Facebook to create uh, Libra. I think it was a very nice joke. Um, but more seriously, uh, last question is, um, when do you see uh, a mass adoption coming? And uh, how do you see the blockchain in, uh, let's say, the, the five, uh, five, five years, let's say? Uh, so are we, will, we, will we have finally uh, people having, uh, you know, using the blockchain with applications or whatever? And uh, how do you see the so blockchain? Let me, let, me, let me throw out some dates. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it, uh, October 31st is an interesting date. Uh, it's a date because it's the deadline. And it's a deadline for Telegram, which is if Telegram doesn't ship uh, Telegram token ton in messenger in their messenger by October 31st they need to refund 1.7 billion US dollars raised in ICO so we're going to see telegram ship in messenger whatever code they have and by the way like they shipped uh, a pretty big drop into github and it looks pretty nice so i think it's going to work uh, then uh, we know that Line, which is 560 million registered users in Japan dominant messenger there is going to ship by December uh, we also know that Clayton, which is the blockchain of Kakao Messenger, the dominant messenger in Korea, is also going to ship by the end of the year. Uh, as far as the People's Bank of China, with 900 million daily active users of WeChat, uh, WeChat and Alipay, uh, you know, we're not sure when they're going to ship. Libra, not sure when they're going to ship. But yeah. correct. But we suspect it will be reasonably soon, right? So I guess. You know, to me, like the way we look at it, uh, you know, I'm wearing my venture capital hat, the way we look at it is, is it's all going to fit in one runway. So, you know, we're, we're deploying capital now because, like, you know, if we drop checks that last for 18 to 24 months, you know, with our co investors, like, that's it's going to happen in that window. So, mm -hmm. that's, that's our mindset. 
Yeah. I would say just quickly, the, you know, the, the question was, when, when is mass adoption going to happen? Uh, and I would say that it's already here in a sense that, um, you know, when I first got involved in Bitcoin, it was a couple, you know, you know, neckbeards, and you know, all of us hanging out and 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 and, 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 t and trying to find, trying to connect with each other, and not really. There was no commercial adoption. There, there was very hard to even just buy Bitcoin. You're taking cash. Too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was just it was very difficult. Now, on a regular basis, I see my friends and colleagues on CNBC. You know, Bitcoin is. Um, you know, ICE, which is the company that owns the New York Stock Exchange, uh, recently um, they're an investor or the backer behind something called Bact, uh, which is a, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's basically a, it's an exchange. Um, the, uh, the idea that some of that would exist five years ago would be just unfathomable. And I think that you're going to see continued adoption of, of, of Bitcoin. I'm not really sure what's going to happen with Ethereum. I think that it might become interesting financial plumbing. Um, I, I think it might also uh, evolve technologically to be uh, uh, an interesting um, sort of complementary application development platform. But I do think that people who are building um, extranet style systems will be able to set up basically like a federated network of web servers and be able to build these multi-operator software applications. And they will have the word blockchain attached to them. And there's always a lot of work in doing those kinds of things. And I don't think there'll be any dominant platform. I think that there will be, um, it'll just be like programming languages or web servers or application stacks. I think we'll settle on a handful that will specialize in different things. And uh, eventually we'll stop talking about blockchain and we'll just start talking about software. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, basically, I mean, I think uh, I agree with that. I mean, the consumer side is going to be really interesting, but I have, a, from my point of view, um, I think on the, uh, you know, in, in terms of dealing with some of the largest financial institutions that are out there, you know, there's folks in the room from Santander. I mean, there's, I think, digital securities and uh, all sorts of financial transactions are, you know, irreversibly on that path towards maybe, you know, the next five years uh, being, you know, <coughs> behind virtually every new issue. Look, and then Christian? Yeah, I think we, you know, are seeing this come in cycles, right? You know, I mean, the first big exchange, Mt. You know, Gox, was Magic the Gathering Online Exchange, right? You know, and uh, Bitcoin went, you know, from a dollar to a hundred to you know, 10,000 to 20,000, right? And people were saying that's mass adoption. And I think that right now we're solving the problem uh, around payments, and a lot of people are focusing on, on currencies. But we're going to see other applications where enterprises start using this, um, you know, for data validation, for more efficient ways of, uh, you know, transferring data. Um, this could mass, you know, the blockchain has the opportunity to kind of create this peer-to-peer -peer network uh, where you actually, you know, don't have to worry about getting a Trojan virus in it, <laughs> in a file that you're going to download, right? And we're, we're going to see. Um, mass adoption as we kind of converge uh, in a way where enterprises are you know utilizing this distributed database technology um, kind of like the, you know the hippie you know <laughs> green green field people that are pushing for the libertarian you know aspects of it as well and so I think there's gonna be a bridge there mm -hmm. where uh, we're gonna see a lot of efficiencies come from as we've all been talking about here different versions of consensus mechanisms and uh, characteristics around these uh, distributed ledgers. And any question and then people yeah, take that's, the that's mic. Okay. I, I, I'm actually laughing because I'm thinking about you know a bunch of guys sitting like us here 30 years ago talking about how you know when we're going to have mass adoption of TCP/IP, right? Um, and I think that's the wrong question. The idea is you know when Gmail is coming out. And to me, it's less about technology, it's when you're capable to deliver a 10x value in a scalable manner. And I don't know when that is going to become, but it's going to be a, an application that consumers, right? My mom, my friend, my brother can actually yeah. use without even knowing that it's actually using blockchain. So um, it's definitely going to be in any time soon, I think. It's probably five to 10 years out. Oh, Mess Messenger-based payments uh, coming this month. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thanks so much, panelists. They're really great. I'm sorry that they turned the sound off out there because it was fascinating just for these few minutes I was in here. I've watched the video. Um, so we're actually, I was wondering if you guys wouldn't mind just sitting in the audience for three minutes. We've got Clarence Louie here who's going to actually do a pitch for three minutes. His um, business is Elastos and uh, we appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Great, thanks. Um, should I move this over? Hi, thanks. Great talk, guys. I love that panel. Um, so my name is Clarence Liu. I'm the VP of Development for Elastos. Um, we are one of the top 10 raises of 2018. You might not have heard of us because we're Asia-based, but we raised $60 million in 2018. So I, we're not, I'm not here for money. Um, we actually did something quite um, amazing. We've actually already acquired about 50% of Bitcoin's hash power. So we have a blockchain platform where we merge mine with Bitcoin. So many of the top uh, mining pools in the world do mine on Elastos or a separate blockchain. But we're basically moving on. We've been in development for two years and we're moving to the point where we're actually going to start one of our social experiments, which is we are moving 16 million tokens on chain for the community to decide how to use. So it's interesting. So we have the problem with anything Stellar or EOSs how to spend money, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna let your votes on the blockchain to figure out how that money is spent. So I'm um, here to pitch basically that we already have about 12, say, teams around the world, so this, we already have about, spent about half a million dollars now. Um, and this, right now we're doing an interim council, which is, uh, we're trialing it out, trying to set up the constitution, figuring out what the rules are uh, on spending this, but as of 2020, the, con the constitution will be coded on chain, and then we'll be, you'll be able to on-chain natively create a smart contract and say, I want to propose to start a community. Uh, we already had this happen, so we now have communities all over the world, like in uh, Hong Kong, Bitwork, in Singapore, in India, where communities already started. We've been funding them. We've been funding projects for between $25,000 to $100,000. So um, especially for the Brazilian guys, if you want to start a community there, or you know projects that are looking for funding, um, it's completely grant funding. It's, we don't want any equity. Any, any equity. It's, we're basically a charitable organization. So um, my business cards out there, and then with brochures out there. Um, Cyberplug.org is the website. You can go there and see right now. There are tons of suggestions that people are putting up. Everything from you know um, an OTC swapping pool to the apps to um, starting communities in you know um, regions all over the world. And we have a proposal system. You can see where the money's going. It's all transparent. It's all uh, on chain. But um, Lasso's itself, uh, we are very quickly in development. We're almost done. Probably uh, end of October, we'll be launched the Ethereum side chain. So we have this Ethereum-based blockchain, and then we also have the on-chain coming, uh, on-chain uh, funding system happening in 2020. Okay, thank you. Don't rush it. Don't pull it down. <laughs> Sorry. Don't don't let. Uh, what happened to the DAO happened to you guys? I, I, I so think it's, know. you know, honestly, out of Ch the, the Chinese side of thing, are they are actually very aggressive on just trying out the social experiment. Um, on chain, they're co they're, they've been coded a 10% max spend per year of okay. the 16 million tokens, but um, we'll just really see how that goes. That's and, awesome. Yes, but it's, it's been pretty cool. We've already had some really good projects up there on uh, that website. Thanks so much, Clarence. And if, if you'd like to speak to him further after this, go for it. We've got like half an hour networking. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's me. I'm going to actually get back. I got a three year old. Thank you. I really, really get back. Yes.